Hi everyone, it's Pastor Brenda. It's really nice to meet you here in this space. I'm just, I'm glad you're here. So we're going to continue on our series on trees. Tonight's going to be all about how trees live into hope. Now we've talked about hope before in this church. You can find these in our you know YouTube channel. But I'm just going to read you a list of what hope is. There's a lot of misunderstanding about hope and our trust issues you know, we get our hopes dashed sometimes because we have misunderstandings about hope. So these, this list I'm going to read to you has come from previous conversations we've had together on our Friday nights when we gather together um, live in person through Zoom to do this study for the first time. So I'm just going to read you this list. Hope is not a feeling, it's a cognitive behavior sequence. Hope is not a wish, nor is it a prayer. Hope doesn't guarantee us the expected outcome. Hope can't be offloaded to God. Hope involves me and my vulnerability. Hope doesn't ignore fear, anxiety, and doubt, but hope confronts fear, anxiety, and doubt. A lot in that sentence. Hope is expressed not in certainty, but in curiosity. A lot in that sentence, too. Hope leads to resiliency. A lot there, too. Hope moves us forward. Hope lightens our darkness. Hope is found in the small everydayness of life. Hope is infectious. Hope is a function of struggle. Hope is plan B. When your plan A breaks down, hope is that thing inside you that says something, I'm worthy of good something, I'm worthy of something good happening to me. So I'm going to make a plan B because my goals allow me to be tenacious and try something new. And my plan B will work or plan M for some things in my life. And then hope is having bloody fists because it keeps on fighting. See, hope is not that ethereal after all. But let's look at hope through trees. So we're going to look at the trees in the book of Job. And if you know that story, it's a story of of a man who's, I mean, gone through trials on every side and much sadness and much despair. And anyway... Job lived in Uz, so let's start with that. The word, the city Uz means wooded place. That means Job lived in like Maple Grove or Pinesville or Forest Hills, some kind of city named after trees. So it's what he was around. And at Job's point of despair, again, when all this catastrophe happened to his family, his belongings, he losing his sons and daughters, at his point of despair, he said this, In Job 19.10, it's it's a 41 chapter book. So 19 is about right in the center of his despair. He says, he has demolished me on every side and I am finished. He has uprooted my hope like a fallen tree. So this is your first conversation question. Let's really dig into this metaphor. I'm going to read it again, but your first question is going to be, um, When hope is smashed, how does it feel like a fallen tree? I'm going to read Job again. It's 1910. He has demolished me on every side and I am finished. He has uprooted my hope like a fallen tree. Talk about that metaphor. Pause this and I'll be back. Good conversation? I hope so. Look how Job uses metaphor to describe his situation. So this is Job 14, 7 through 9. Even a tree has more hope. If it is cut down, it will sprout again and grow new branches. Though its roots have grown old in the earth and its stump decays at the scent of water, it will bud and sprout again like a new seedling. With trees, they're always trying to come back to life. Cut down one and a story isn't necessarily over. I want to just include a photo right here to inspire you about trees and hope. Chlorophyll can actually be found in tree stumps. They look dead, but if you do scrapings of them, and scientists do this, they find that they're still chlorophyll. And they're beginning to understand that trees are a part of a root system, and this root system communicates with each other. And these trees, because they're a part of a family, will often still give nutrients, give their sugar to the stump to keep it alive still. There's a whole lot of thought about hope in that. Let me read to you from the Smithsonian article that I found. It is fabulous about how trees talk to each other. It just is a direct quote. 
All the trees here and in every forest that is not too damaged are connected to each other through underground fungal networks. Trees share water and nutrients through the networks and also use them to communicate. They send distress signals about drought and disease, for example, or insects attacks, and other trees alter their behavior when they receive these messages. Scientists call these mycorrhizal networks. There's this whole underground thing where trees are warning each other, like up ahead, the beetles are coming and they send the message and it goes out and the trees then actually send out a scent that deters the beetles. It's, I mean, it's just, it's fascinating. Another fascinating story that I've read in my research about this is that there's a date tree called Methuselah. What happened was in the 1960s, uh, a jar was found. I mean, some stuff was dug up an architectural dig and in it was a little jar of seeds. And I guess because it wasn't important, it was thrown into a drawer for 40 years. 10 years ago, when some scientists found it, decided, hmm, these are date seeds or whatever. Let's see if they can still grow. So he did the proper fertilizing of a seed and it sprouted. And now 10 years later, this tree is called Methuselah. It is a date tree. It is 10 feet tall and it is beginning to pollinate. Trees want to come back to life. Trees are full of hope. This sounds like a whole lot of plan B's to me. So when Job declared, even a tree has more hope, who? This is what he means. And from our opening quote that I read to you one more time, the trees know about the winter and about change, about the falling and about the loss. And they grow anyway. And I got to add, there's a whole lot there I could be saying about the underground network and the need uh, trees have of each other to warn each other, to be there for each other, to feed each other, to encourage each other. You can see a sermon in there, can't you? So the story of Job, of course, is about Job and then his friends who try to comfort him in the midst of this catastrophe. And they're trying. They're really trying. But what none of them know is what we know from the anonymous author, the author of the book of Job, gives us the behind the scenes. And if you know the story, you know this behind the scenes. So I'm just going to read. It's Job 1 and 2. I'm going to read you two verses of it so you get a picture of the, the wager that was placed on Job's life. One day the members of Job 1, 6 through 7. One day the members of the heavenly court came to present themselves before the Lord, and the accuser, Satan, came with them. Where have you come from? the Lord asked Satan. Satan answered, I've been patrolling the earth, watching everything that's going on. And from there he saw Job and they make they made this wager. It's really hard to understand. But catastrophe strikes. Job's friends try to have answers. And Job has all kinds of questions of answers, but they're always why questions. I get that. We had in a series um, back on our how to read the Bible conversation series, we did a lesson on how to read the Bible with questions and how questions really lead us to some deeper and new truths. So I just want to, to ping that because questions are going to get us somewhere. So God does answer Job's questions finally. And it happens in a whirlwind, or it's even been translated as a tornado, but it's nature. It is, it is nature coming in a violent way. And it's, it's, Job, it's God answering Job's questions. Three chapters worth, 38, 39, 40, 41, four chapters, excuse me, of God answering Job's questions, and it's all through nature out of a whirlwind. I want to just tag my favorite one. It's all about the ostrich. Job 39, 13 through 18, it's five verses. And it says, God is saying, look at the ostrich, explain this. And then the verses go on to explain the weirdness of the ostrich. So did you know there was an ostrich in the Bible? And that the ostrich was created weird. And even God says the ostrich was created weird. And use that as, an, as to tell Job about what's going on in his life. Fascinating thought. But in all of the questions that Job answered, God answers back, Question, 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 but it's all about nature. It is God suggesting that there's an order, a timing, and laws that neither Job 
nor humanity, his friends, or us can understand or that we're really aware of. Because how could any author other than the creator of the universe know about this order, timing, and laws? This, this is the larger story of God we talk about here. When Job and his friends argued about where God is, God then shows up in nature and answers with questions. And God didn't try to attempt to explain in human terms. He just, nature, 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 question, question, question. And of course, there were trees in those answers. God uses trees to teach about time on a vaster scale. Trees are the longest lived creatures on the planet. They're the only creatures that leave account of every year that they have lived with their rings. Some life lessons learned from trees. This is also from that Smithsonian article, direct quote, but you can see these stories. Wise old mother trees feed their saplings with liquid sugar and warn the neighbors when danger approaches. Reckless youngsters take foolhardy risk with leaf shedding, life chasing, light chasing, and excessive drinking, and usually pay with their lives. Crown princes wait for the old monarchs to fall so they can take their place in the full glory of sunlight. It's all happening in the ultra slow motion that this tr is tree time. So that when we what we see is a freeze frame of the action. So many life lessons there. And trees are the only thing from our childhood that actually get bigger. So when we go back to visit what we knew as a childhood, we see bigger trees. Maybe our faith can be bigger also, right? We're supposed to have childlike faith. So may that grow to be bigger, like the trees are growing up in your own neighborhood, to be bigger all the time. God is patiently trying to get us to think long term, to think about the larger story. A human life compared to an ancient tree is short. 70 years versus 5,000 years. God wants us to think on the, more on the scale of trees than of mice. In Isaiah 65, 21 through 22, it says, in those days, people will live in the houses they build and eat the fruit of their own vineyards. Unlike the past, invaders will not take their houses and confiscate their vineyards, for my people will live as long as trees, and my chosen ones will have time to enjoy their hard-won gains. All right, so let's talk about this tree time and see the um, story of Jonah and the tree in the Jonah story, because there's a whale and a fish, and there's a tree. So it's just the summary, you probably know about the whale or the fish. And this is going to be from chapter 4. It's only 11 verses. It's a short chapter. But it, it begins with Nineveh repenting. Nineveh is a huge city. And verse 1 talks about how Jonah is, walks barely into the city. It says that the, the first one-third of this huge metropolis, he starts preaching the message that God gave him. And the whole city and the king even repents for a preacher I love that part of the story. But let's continue on the Jonah story in, in verse 2. So verse 1 is this thing that preachers love. Verse 2 becomes, Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? This is why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you were a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filling with, filled with unfailing love. You're eager to turn back from destroying people. Yay! This is that larger story of God that we talk about here. This mentions mercy and compassion. This mentions God being slow to get angry. This is like God giving us time to figure it out. Think about that. And then it ends with this filled with unfailing love. But in the Hebrew, we talked about this in a couple of sermon series back, hesed love. Hesed love is this Hebrew word, the word hesed, that there is no English counterpart for it, but it's got five different meanings. And one is, is unfailing love. Another one is loyal love. And it's, it's, it's a deep, deep love we can't put words on. And here is this verse. It's said five times in the entire Bible in that exact, those five characteristics in that same order. So it is a description of God. And here we get it. And this is what Jonah says back in verse 3. Just kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will not happen. 
verse 5 and 6. Then Jonah went out to the east side of the city and made his shelter to sit under as he waited to see what would happen to the city. And the Lord God arranged for a leafy plant to grow there, and soon it spread its broad leaves over Jonah's head, shading him from the sun. This eased his discomfort, and Jonah was very grateful for the plant. Here is our tree. Jonah built a shelter, and God built a better shelter for him. But we continue on, and what I'm going to read to you is not me at living. This is from the scripture, verses 7 through 9. But God also arranged for a worm. The next morning at dawn, the worm ate through the stem of the plant so that it withered away. And as the sun grew hot, God arranged for a scorching east wind to blow on Jonah. The sun beat down on his head until he grew faint and wished to die. Death is certainly better than living like this, he exclaimed. Then God said to, to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry because the plant died? Yes, Jonah retorted, even angry enough to die. Good thing Jonah's, and God's slow to anger, right? God is forever trying to get us to think in the long term, to think of the larger story. Jonah is thinking like a mouse. And God's answer is similar to his answer to Job because he answers with a question. Verses 10 and 11, notice nature and notice how God ends this with a question. Then the Lord said, you feel sorry about the plant, though you did, not put, you did nothing to put it there. It came quickly and it died quickly. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, not to mention all the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? The end. A question, no answer, but a question that makes you learn something, right? God is suggesting there's order, timing, and laws that neither Job nor Jonah nor humanity can, un can understand. So you ever heard this one? Maybe when you were younger, if your troubles are many and your triumphs are few, Mighty Oak was once a little nut like you. No one ever sees a tree grow, but eventually trees stand tall, like hope. I'm going to put a picture on the screen that tells quite a story. I want you to look at it for a moment. And then I want you to have this conversation question. So I'm going to give you the question first, and then you can look at the picture. When the picture goes off the screen, hit pause and have the conversation. The question is, what story is this picture telling you about hope or your faith? Here's the picture. So how was that conversation? May you, this is your benediction, may you live your week in tree time. May your roots go deep. If you wake up this mor tomorrow morning and there's something that's very painful that's going on, may your roots go deep, send out that message that you need some help and your tree friends come and support you. May you be able to withstand the storm, grow through the pain, and may you be able to reach your branches high into the sky and to glorify God. May you live your time in tree time. You may not see growth this week, but may you continue to grow until you become this mighty oak. Grow. I'll see you again.